Facing of women physical strength is undermined and sabotaged. Physical incapacity is a form of feminine beauty and a symbol of male wealth. He is rich enough to keep her unable to labor, useless, ornamental. Women are also mutilated physically or by fashion and custom so that whatever physical strength they may have is meaningless. Third tenet of male supremacist ideology. <clears throat> the third tenet is the capacity to terrorize, to use self and strength to inculcate fear, fear in a whole class of persons, of a whole class of persons. The symbols of terror are commonplace and utterly familiar the gun, the knife, the bomb, the fist, and so on. Even more significant is the hidden symbol of terror, the penis. Terror issues forth from the male, illuminates his essential nature and his basic purpose. There you are. This is an essentialist statement. Terror issues forth from the male. It illuminates his essential nature and his purpose. His man is a terrorist by nature. That's what he's saying. Okay? <clears throat> the legend of male violence is the most celebrated legend of mankind, and from it emerges the character of man. He is dangerous. He is biologically ordained to terrorize women and other creatures into submission and conformity. Fourth, the power of naming, the power of naming. There is this radical feminist theologian called Mary Daly. She's a colorful woman. Wherever she gives a lecture, there are lots of people going there because she's so radical. She began as, she began as a Catholic theologian. And then she, dis she published actually a book that was a bestseller. It was called The Church and the, the Church and the Second Sex, in which she argued for equality of women within the church, within the Catholic Church. And then later on, she became disenchanted with the church, and she decided that she was no longer a Catholic or a Christian at all. And then <clears throat> there was a problem, because her book was so successful that the publisher wanted to come out with a second edition of the book. But how could she approve the second edition of a book in which she argues for the equality of women in the church where she doesn't care anymore about the church because she's no longer a Christian, much less a Catholic? Well, in the end, she came to an agreement with the publisher that the book would be published with a, um, a special introduction post-Christian introduction. And in that post-Christian introduction, she, she makes fun of herself as the writer of the book, how naive this woman was, thinking there could be equality in the church. And she goes, to say, she goes on to say, to say that there can be equality within the church, within the Catholic church for women, is like saying that there can be equality for black people in the Ku Klux Klan. Despite which, she kept teaching at a Catholic university. I wouldn't imagine an African-American person teaching at the Ku Klux Klan institution. So there you see the in inconsistencies. You know, one thing is the talk. The different thing is your salary, right? So anyway, that's Ma and Mary Daly makes a big deal of naming. Uh, he says, well, men have appropriated language. So they have, they're the ones who've given names and used language for their interest, to, to, to signify their supremacy and their power. So for example, we are told that Adam gave names to all the animals. And that was a God-given power. Because in primitive cultures, by giving a name, you established power over the other creature or thing. That's why you give name to your children. It's a symbol of your authority and power over them. Right? Men have done that. So now radical feminists, are embarked into this process of changing language. Um, and so they don't talk about history anymore because, of course, history is his story. So they talk about her story now. Um, this is supposed to be somehow funny. So don't worry about the video recording. Just if you feel like laughing, please. 
Let's make it as natural as possible. We have a classroom full of people here. So, no history, but her story and other stuff like that, okay? So, the next um, tenet of male supremacist ideology, fifth, is men have the power of owning. You will not be tested on these specific tenets. It's an illustration just to show you what I mean by an essentialist position. The power of owning. True, a married woman in the United States today can own her own hairbrush and clothes as she could not through most of the 19th century. Should she run away from home, she's not likely to be hunted down like a runaway slave as she would have been through most of the 19th century. But the power of, although she may still be beaten up for her effrontery, but the power of ma male owning, like all male power, is not hindered or confined by specifics. This is the, ma this, the male power the, is the presumption that the male's right to own the female and her issue is natural, predating history, post-dating progress. Marriage as an institution developed from rape as a practice. This is a famous radical feminist statement, by the way. Six, the power of money. Money is a distinctly male power. Money speaks, but it speaks with a male voice. Money properly expresses masculinity. Money has an extreme sexual component. Men are supposed to hold sperm as they are supposed to hold money. One meaning of the verb to spend is to ejaculate. One meaning of the verb to husband is to conserve or save. A husband, in this sense, is one who conserves or, sa or saves his sperm, except to fuck for the purpose of impregnating. In the male system, control of money means sexual maturity, as does the ability to control ejaculation. A boy spends his sperm and his money on women. A man uses his sperm and his women to produce wealth. A boy spends, a man produces. <coughs> and then finally, the seventh tenet of male power is the power of sex. Uh, she claims that men, says, men say that women have the power of sex because they cause erections in them. But in reality, women do whatever they want them to do. Therefore, it's men who control women. And therefore, it's men who also have the power of sex. It's quite a, a convoluted argument. This is um, Andrea Dorkin. Um, now, the radical feminists um, do what we call systemic analysis, systemic, not systematic. OK, don't confuse the two words. Systemic analysis. Systemic analysis. What is systemic analysis? Systemic analysis consists of <coughs> analyzing society as a system in conflict. It's actually a Marxist concept. So we analyze society as a system in conflict. Men against women, in this case. In traditional Marxist ideology, it would be the rich versus the poor. And other mm, ideologies or th mm, religious ideologies, theologies, we have black liberation theology, Latin American liberation theology. There are many different kinds of theology. In, in those theologies that use systemic analysis, you have the two groups, the one against the other. Now, what systemic analysis entails is that we do not look at the individual as such. So some men may be wonderful, individually speaking, lovely people, but they are part of the oppressor class. And therefore, they're part of the enemy. They have to be fought against because they are males. In traditional Marxist uh, ideology, the rich. You, the, this person can be a wonderful, lovely, rich person, very charitable, whatever you want. But as long as he's part of the, the class of the oppressors, the rich, he's to be fought against. We don't care for individual options or personality types. That is what systemic analysis entails. Uh, of course, this is based both on Marxism and on mm, our understanding of postmodern, the postmodern understanding of the, how society is constructed, how it is shaped 
through, through power. In reality, Marxism and postmodern ideology 